Hey guys and welcome back to the channel and as promised we're going to be looking at some IBM computers in this video. In particular we're going to be looking at this IBM value point at the bottom, the 486DX2 slash D. Now just look at this with the creative CD-ROM drive. On the back you've got your random assortment of goodies like this power supply unit, we have the PS2 ports for the keyboard and the mouse, obviously this being an IBM. We have two serial ports, a parallel port and a VGA connector. I also see two expansion card and one is especially interesting and that is the sound card which is sitting there on the left. There seems to be a poor modem card on the right also and that's typically one of those cards that gets discarded right away and <laughs> would probably be the case here also. So let's open her up to see what we have inside. Now before you start manhandling it, I do want to point out this button here that if you press it down it will open up the case very easily. So let's take a peek inside. Pretty standard desktop layout. I see a modem card here so I'm going to be removing that as I have no use for a card like this. But on the other side here I suspect we have something far more interesting so let's take a peek. And sure enough we have a Creative Sound Blaster Pro 2 here. Very very nice sound card. Now the computer was pretty dusty inside especially here on the motherboard and my air compressor wasn't able to clean up all of the dust here but all in all I mean I have seen worse it's definitely uh, doable so let's take it inside and take a closer look. On second thought before I do that I will be cleaning the case a little bit as it was pretty filthy so yeah it was a nice sunny day outside so I took the opportunity to clean the case a little bit. Now that we have it inside let's take a look at this CD-ROM drive which was part of a Creative Labs package so it came uh, with the sound card. We also have a 1.44 megabyte disk drive. I'm not really sure about the condition of the CD-ROM drive because I was expecting to see like a lid or something on the front of the CD-ROM drive. If we move it to the side we get a better view of the motherboard and the riser card. And one of the good things about these IBM value points as opposed to the PS2 series is that these systems use pretty much off-the-shelf components in the sense that they follow the standard PC architecture so you will find ISA slots, you have a Visa local bus slot here, it uses standard uh, IDE uh, interfaces for the hard drive, it has a standard floppy drive connector. So you don't have to deal with all of this IBM proprietary stuff that you see in PS2 machines. So this is one of those highly integrated motherboards. I already spot the integrated graphics. We have four megabytes of RAM. We have the riser card here. But I wanted to hook up my LCD panel and I noticed that there was a pin missing on the VGA connector on this computer. And the VGA cable that came with my LCD panel had all of these pins. So yeah, it was physically impossible to plug in this connector to the back of the VGA connector of the PC. So yeah, that was a bit of a bummer. But fortunately I do have the monitor that goes with this computer and this is the 6318 color VGA monitor. It kind of resembles these old PS2 monitors but it doesn't have the controls on the side here. Otherwise it's a fairly decent looking monitor. On the back we see the model number so it's the 6318-002 from 1993. And indeed that one is missing that particular pin. So with that I am able to hook it up to this PC. Now when trying to start an old PC like this you need to realize that one of four things might happen. One, it will simply work. Two, it will be completely dead and won't do anything at all. Three, it will fail violently. Either something will pop, break or explode. And four, it will work briefly, either for a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes, and then it will fail. So let's see what this one will do. Green LED, that's good. We hear sounds, I hear a hard drive, I hear the power supply fan, I hear the computer starting. And we have a visual, so that is definitely good. 
So it's gonna display some error codes because I don't have a keyboard, a mouse connected, and probably the CMOS battery has died. So yeah, let's take a look at what we have. So we have a keyboard error, makes sense. We don't have a keyboard connected. We have a pointing device error, makes sense. We don't have a mouse connected. Configuration change has occurred, makes sense. Disk drive error can be the hard drive or the disk drive and the time settings, which are incorrect. So not really something to worry about at this point. One thing that did worry me is that all of a sudden the hard drive stopped spinning. And when I turned off the PC and I turned it on again, the hard drive remained completely dead. There was no noise coming out of the hard drive. So that was a bit of a bummer. So here you can see what's happening. We turn on the PC and the hard drive starts spinning. And it makes a fairly normal you no know, hard drive sound. But the PC is unable to boot from the hard drive. And even when booting into MS-DOS, I cannot access the C drive or F-Disk cannot read the disk. So that's definitely a problem. And what happens after a while, as the disk is sitting there and it's obviously spinning, all of a sudden it will simply stop. And all of this is happening while the computer is still turned on. So yeah, that's a bit of a bummer. I kind of like these Western Digital Caviar drives. I like the sound that they make. So this was one from, I think, May 1993. I have a replacement, so I'm going to be using this 425 megabyte one from December of 1993. So hopefully that will run a little bit better. The BIOS in this PC should be able to auto detect the 400 megabyte hard drive without any issues. So next up, I wanted to disassemble this computer because in order to get to the hard drive, I already need to remove some other parts. So let's take a quick look here. We have the CD-ROM. Above that, we have some room for an additional five and a quarter inch device. We have the power supply unit, which isn't screwed in for some reason. There's this riser card here. We have the disk drive. So yeah, let's start to see what we need to take apart now. And we need to start by disassembling this bracket here, which will give us access to the riser card and it will also remove the disk drive and the hard drive. So we need to unscrew a couple of screws here and then we can take off this entire assembly. First disconnect all of the hard drive and the floppy drive cables and we already have that. Next up is the riser card. It's a tight fit, but we can get it off of the motherboard quite easily. We have five ISA slots in total and we also have a Visa Local Bus slot. Let's go ahead and remove the cables from the motherboard. There are a couple of screws that hold the motherboard in place. So let's go ahead and remove that. We don't need to remove these individual screws here at the back. As they are an integral part of the motherboard, we will be removing these connectors here, which are for the speaker, uh, reset and some LEDs probably. And then the motherboard just slides on out of the case very easily. Next up, we have the power supply unit. And as I said previously, this one wasn't screwed in at all. So that was a bit surprising. Now, obviously, because this is an AT based system, the actual power button is a part of this power supply. So we will need to unscrew this as well if we want to get full access to the power supply unit. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, as I was removing the power button from this uh, computer case, I couldn't help but wondering if this is the correct way to hook up those mains power cables. Okay, I really doubt that this passed the IBM quality assurance department. But anyways, let's go ahead and remove the CD-ROM drive. Let's take a look at the hard drive here. This is a Western Digital Caviar 2340. So this is a 340 megabyte hard drive. So like I said, I did hear it spinning up, but after a couple of minutes, it just died completely and there was no sound coming out of it anymore. The disk drive is an Alps Electric 1.44 megabyte disk drive. All standard stuff, so nothing proprietary. The power supply unit from Link World doesn't seem to be a standard IBM power supply, most notably due to the fact that it has three different screws and one missing screw. I do assume that this is an aftermarket thing. It does look pretty clean. There is no bulging on the capacitors. I was able to turn it on with this power supply, so I was pretty happy with that. But 
with everything out of the case the first time I tried to start the damn thing the following happened. So I saw a flash and you had that typical sound of something kind of exploding in the power supply. Unfortunately, I wasn't filming at the time. Now I'm not going to be looking at the root cause of this failure for now. I did check the fuse and that was still intact. So something in the output section of this power supply obviously failed. And yeah, given the age of this power supply, I'm just going to replace it with another one. Now, time to take a look at the motherboard. And as you can see, it is pretty dirty. There's a lot of cooked dust on this thing, which is really kind of baked into the motherboard. And I couldn't even get it off with my air compressor. So let's see how we can clean this up. Now, a lot of people will tell you that isopropyl alcohol is a great way to clean PCBs. And that is definitely the case. But when you have a motherboard which is as dirty as this one, applying isopropyl alcohol alone will not solve your problems. Because let me show you what happens when you apply isopropyl alcohol to a motherboard like this. Now as long as it's wet it doesn't look half bad but as soon as it starts drying up you can see the buildup of the dust which is still on the motherboard. So that's not good. And as you can see here with an air compressor it doesn't really get rid of all of that dust because it is really kind of baked into the motherboard. So here we have the before picture. And here we have the after picture. It is a little bit better, but it's definitely not optimal. And here the same thing. I mean, the dust is really baked into the motherboard. I mean, just applying some uh, isopropyl alcohol doesn't, doesn't fix it at all. So here, for example, you can see that there is still a lot of dust cooked into the motherboard, which is very difficult to get off. Now something that I do like to use is this natural bristle brush. It's uh, specifically made for cleaning PCBs. It has a wooden handle. It's really good at cleaning dust and particles that sit between these little components. So it's just a matter of, you know, going through the motion and hitting every component. Because what you need to understand is when it is wet like this, you will not see the dust anymore. It's only when it completely dries up again that you will see the dust build up. I'm going to be removing the coin cell here so that I can hit that area here. Now it does take a longer time to dry as the water doesn't evaporate that fast as isopropyl alcohol. Obviously you can uh, apply some isopropyl alcohol after you have treated it with some distilled water just to make it go uh, faster. But in the end the result is pretty phenomenal. So here we have the motherboard. It's already a lot cleaner, but as you will see later on, as we will zoom into certain areas of the motherboard, you will see that it still needs some work. Because that's the thing with these PCBs. You can only see the final result when it's completely dry and then you start seeing everything. So on the left hand side, you see all kinds of connectors here. So this is a very tightly integrated motherboard. Obviously we have the PS2 ports for the keyboard and the mouse. We have two serial ports. We have a parallel port. And we also have a VGA connector here because this is a motherboard with a VGA on board. So it is missing this pin here in the middle row section. So that makes it difficult to, to hook up a standard monitor. The motherboard comes with a coin cell battery. So that's really nice. So we don't need to deal with battery leakages. We have the riser card connector here which kind of looks like a Visa Local bus connector and actually it's nothing more than a Visa Local bus connector. It just uh, allows you to hook up this riser card here, which will give you some additional ISA slots and a Visa Local bus slot. On the top right side, we have this CPU. There is no fan, we just have this heatsink here. There is room for an optional coprocessor. Now, this 486 here is a DX266 megahertz, so it has the math coprocessor built in. But I'm guessing that this board was also used for like 486 SX based systems. So you had the option to have a floating point unit as well. Now to get the CPU from its socket, we need to open up this little hinge here so that we can pull the CPU out. And as soon as we pull it out, we see the Intel Overdrive Ready logo here. So this means that we can actually put in an Intel Overdrive Pentium CPUs. These are running at either 63 or 83 megahertz. 
But this is a standard Intel DX266 MHz CPU. It didn't come with a fan, so they just slapped on a heatsink like this. Now that should be sufficient for a DX266 MHz. Now with these types of sockets you need to pay close attention to this little notch here that you see on the CPU as well as on the socket itself. So you need to make sure that the CPU is properly oriented. So we're going to take this and put that here. Now it is possible to insert this CPU the wrong way. So really pay close attention to the orientation of this notch. Now on the motherboard we also have this slot here which is meant to provide the computer with some level 2 cache but this seems to be missing here. Now by default I mean a computer like this should have level 2 cache. I mean the CPU has 8 kilobytes of level 1 cache in the CPU itself but a 486 does need to have level 2 cache as well. So I was very surprised to see this slot being empty in this computer. Now as I was going through the motherboard, I found this Texas Instrument chip with the part number 52G7803. And upon googling it, I came across this interesting article talking about a double keystroke input error on some IBMs. And apparently this is caused by this particular Texas Instrument chip. And what they thought of as a workaround for this problem is to remove the level 2 cache. So that's probably the reason why they have disabled the level 2 cache just by removing that cache module from the computer. We have onboard IDE controller and floppy drive controller. So this is provided by this uh, little chip here which acts as a floppy drive and the hard drive controller. We have a standard AT power supply connector. We have one SIM module installed, one 4 megabyte SIM. We have four sockets available. Maximum amount of memory for this machine is 64 megabytes, so that's 16 megabytes per socket. We have an S3 video card, the 805. We have the feature connector here, we have the RAM, so everything is nicely packaged on board. We have some additional uh, expansion slots here for additional video memory. And this is a Visa Local Bus type of video card. Now I wanted to add an LCD panel to this computer, but this missing plug here in the VGA connector prevented me from doing so. And I didn't have any cable where it didn't have that particular pin. So I only had normal VGA connectors, which kind of look like this with all of the pins installed. But then again, I mean, the VGA spec doesn't mandate that all of these uh, pins are uh, effectively populated. So what I did was I just took a set of pliers here and I decided to rip off the pin from my LCD VGA cable like so, bending another pin in the process, of course. So that needed to be fixed like so. And then finally, I was able to hook up this cable to the IBM and see if it would work with the LCD panel. And sure enough, it did. Now hitting F1 when we see the IBM logo will allow us to enter the BIOS of this machine. And it's a pretty standard configuration utility here. We have the 486DX2 installed with the Math Pro embedded. We have an S3 video card, 400 megabyte hard drive. We have a mouse installed, 4 megabytes of memory, 8 kilobyte of internal level 1 cache, no external cache. As you can see, the socket on the motherboard wasn't populated. 1 megabyte of video RAM. We can also see the flash EEPROM revision level. 1.44 megabyte disk drive, two serial ports, one parallel port, and then some startup options, which I totally neglected to look at. We also have some password options and the date and time settings. But as I was starting the machine, I always got this prompt here. And this typically means that there is no you know, OS installed on the hard drive. And then you get this code here, which basically says that there is no bootable device. But I could access the hard drive if I boot it from a disk drive. Uh, all the files were there, uh, even the startup files, the MS-DOS files. So in theory, it should have booted, but it didn't. 
So then I was thinking perhaps it recognizes the hard drive geometry in a different way, so it might be best to just delete the partition and start over again. But the volume label here contained a lowercase letter and with the MS-DOS 6 boot disk I wasn't able to remove that partition. Now with a Windows 98 boot disk I was able to delete the partition as for some reason the volume label wasn't picked up. So I decided to delete the partition and then install MS-DOS 6.2. So a basic MS-DOS 6.22 installation is good because it will format the hard drive, so it will check that. And it also gives me the opportunity to check the disk drive because I am going to be installing MS-DOS 6.22 using actual floppies. And that seemed to work fine, so it went through all the three disks without any issues. And at the end, we had a working MS-DOS 6.22 installation. But even after the successful MS-DOS 6.22 install, I still got confronted with this screen. And when I entered the BIOS again, I noticed that the second startup device by default is disabled. So this thing will only boot from a disk drive. So after setting this to the hard drive, I was able to reboot the system. And this time it was booting from the hard drive just fine. And that's it for part one of this value point series. I mean, we got the system up and running, that's good. We took a look at the hardware. Next step is to assemble the entire thing back together again. We're gonna look at the sound card. We're gonna look at the CD-ROM player because I think that also has a couple of issues. So I hope you've enjoyed part one already. I hope to see you guys in part two. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, giving a comment, consider subscribing to the channel. And I hope to see you guys soon. Bye-bye.